Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Peace United Methodist Church. It's great to have all of us gathered together once more virtually for a, a time of worship and celebration on this beautiful Sunday morning. My name is Pastor Jim. It's great to, to, to be gathered together. And uh, before we kind of get started with things, we want to go over a couple of announcements, some things that are coming up in the life of the church. Uh, next Sunday, August 23rd, we're going to have the big red bus out front of the church. We're going to have an opportunity for all of us to come. And, and donate blood. This is a really important thing at any time whenever we do it, but especially right now, there's such a need for blood. And if um, you might have the antibodies uh, w within your plasma, they're testing for that, and that we can actually help contribute to, uh, to the pursuit of a vaccine. And so, so we want to encourage you to go to our website, and there you can register for your time to come and d donate blood. And so it's going to be all social distance and a very safe thing, very organized and uh, we just want to encourage you to consider doing that on August 23rd. In addition to that, we've got this great fundraiser that's happening. Uh, the Pursuing Peace class in our church has partnered with Advancing Native Missions. And uh, this fundraiser is to support the work that they do, and it comes with some great coffee. And so all you got to do is come up on, on August 23rd, on that Sunday, and uh, for $20, or if you want to donate more, you can, you get a bag of really, really good tasting coffee, and you might even get a Peace Church mug. And so it's definitely worth coming up and supporting supporting this important mission uh, and, 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 and donating funds to that. Speaking of donating funds, you know, we've been uh, encouraging you to go to peaceumcgiving.org to give of your tithe and your offering. That's a part of what we do each Sunday in this thing that we call worship. And, uh, and so you can go there right now to that website and you can put in uh, your offering right there online. But if that's something that you're not wanting to do at this very moment, um, then we want to let you know that later on in the service during one of our songs, we're going to have a QR code. If you don't know what a QR code is, it's a, it's a weird little design looking thing. It'll be there on the screen. And all you've got to do is take your phone, open up your camera app and point it toward that QR code. And it'll link you right to the website on your phone. So you don't even have to jump out of worship to go and give. You can do it right there from your phone. We just want to make it as easy as possible for you to continue to give of your tithe and your offering. So we are thrilled that you're here with us. We've got a great morning of worship. We've got a great interview with uh, uh, maybe some, some familiar faces from the past that we can't wait for you to check out. Um, and we've got a very, very special musical offering at the end of worship. So we don't want you checking out early. When the sermon is in full swing, don't log off at that point and make me cry. We want you hanging out till the very end of the service because we are convinced that you will be blessed by uh, the music that we'll provide all the way through the service. So we hope to see you when we finish as well. But we're thrilled that you're here, and, uh, and we are just excited that we're in worship together this morning. Today, won't you lift your voices from wherever you are? We've seen what you can do, oh God of wonders. Your power has no end. The things you've done before. In greater measure, you will do again. Cause there's no prison wall you can break through, no mountain you can't move. All things are possible. There's no broken body you can't raise, no soul that you can't save. All 
rose in victory, and now you're seated. So great to be gathered together in worship, and we've got Julie Chatfield, our yes. children's ministry director, here with us again this morning. How Good are you doing this morning, morning Julie? Jim. Good morning, Peace. I had such a monotonous week this week, and I know that sounds strange, right? But it, this is always the highlight. I always love coming here on Sunday morning and at least being with the few people that are here. So it yeah. is a good morning indeed. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, we've been doing this uh, interview uh, series happening mm -hmm. along with our worship series where we're hearing stories from people in our congregation. And, uh, and it's just great to get to know some more people, but also to hear some of these incredible stories. And, uh, and so Jeremy Friedman has been conducting these interviews. And we've got a really great one this morning that, uh, that Jeremy is very passionate about. <laughs> I'm and so excited so Jeremy's it. a longtime member of the church. He serves on church council. And so let's all put our hands together and welcome Mr. Jeremy Friedman. Welcome. Thank you, Jim. Uh, good morning, Jim. Good morning, Julie. And but before we start, so that Peace Church coffee mug, I need to replace my master's coffee mug with a Peace Church coffee mug. Just, just saying. Anyway, um, this uh, this interview that you're about to uh, that you're about to listen and watch uh, is it's a really special story to me. Um, this is a story. It's, it's a great illustration of Peace Church in action. 
Uh, so I sat down a couple of weeks ago with Peace Church's former youth director, Brandon Sangster, and Peace's current youth director, Emma Harmon. This is a great story of a mentor and mentee. Reason why this is so special to me was because I was at Peace Church. I was a longtime youth counselor. I was Brandon's tag team partner in youth ministry, and I was Emma's youth counselor. So I got to bear witness and kind of be along for the ride on their walk together. Here's their story. So the current youth director here, <laughs> Emma Harmon, was your youth kid. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Hi, I'm Emma Harmon and I found peace. As a young sixth grader coming from Illinois, Emma found much more. Friends, family, and ultimately her calling. I was a little bit of an obnoxious, loud 11-year-old. I'm going to show you a photo. Oh, no. From 6th, 7th grade. And just tell me your first impressions of this photo. Ah! The Platinum Girls! The bottom of this picture says, Church Girls, I'm proud of it. And man, that's what we were. And it was Brandon Sangster who led this church girl through her teenage years. I always thought that Brandon was super fun. He was like really great and easy to talk to. I remember um, vividly a, um, a, a youth Sunday where we got to sing together. And I couldn't get the harmony the way that Brandon was trying to teach me the harmony. <laughs> I couldn't get it. And I worked with Brandon and, you know, by the time we finally, you know, performed and led worship with, the, with Mighty to Save, I could do the dang harmony. He taught me how to harmonize. He taught me how to lead worship. Brandon saw a lot of gifts in you early on. He would encourage me to do good as a person, to do good as a singer, to do good as a, as a youth, to do good as a student. And little did he know what all of that encouragement would unleash. I would just come to him and be like, B, guess what we could do? And he'd be like, oh no, Emma. She came to me and she said, I got this wild idea of doing missions and I think we can do them monthly. And I, and I had this whole plan in my head and I was like, all right, <laughs> bring, bring it, rein it in a little bit. I brought this binder to Brandon and was like, here you go. This is what 4M is going to be. Cool? All right, thanks. She comes to me a week later with a binder with tabs and everything in it and it's all organized because that's how Emma is and uh, we sat and we had this conversation. I wouldn't have been able to do it without Brandon. He challenged me to think about things that I didn't, I didn't think about before. He encouraged me to pursue the things that might have felt a little crazy for a 13, 14 year old. It was just this cool experience of um, someone that I've led for so long now turning and leading me almost. It would have never grown out of that little binder if there was an encouragement. There was this, ex this excitement um, that I would say was almost contagious. I don't really know what Brandon was thinking, but I'm grateful. <laughs> he believed in you. He believed in you. Was there a conversation while she was growing up here in high school about youth ministry, about seminary. I knew she had a passion for music, but I also knew that she had um, gifts and, and skill sets for, for ministry in some way, shape, or form. And this belief fostered a calling beyond high school. I remember calling B and being like, so I'm thinking about like, doing some like youth pastor stuff like I'm thinking about like you know working with youth groups after college he's like okay duh like he's like yeah <laughs> makes sense <laughs> glad you finally figured it out <laughs> talk about Brandon now being a mentor to you as a fellow youth director it's crazy it's crazy he was always there to listen and he's still always there to listen. I mean, when all of this COVID quarantine stuff happened, I was like, Brandon, what are you doing for youth ministry right now? How do I do this? <laughs> um, and he was, he was like, you want to set up a Zoom call? Like, let's have a conversation. I actually shared with, with her a picture um, recently, and um, it's a picture of us um, with a, a group from an, uh, a mission trip and I said, look, this is crazy, you know, this is 10 years ago and uh, who knew I was sitting next to the, you know, next youth director of PCU. 
I've been working with the students on their songs for their worship. And, you know, I realized the other day that I was singing harmonies into their ear. And what a full circle thing that is for me, right? You know, Brandon sang harmonies into my ear to get me to lead worship, and now I'm doing that with our students too. It's pretty cool. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. What does it mean to you to be the youth director for your home church? It's unreal. It's, I mean, I said it earlier, but it's living the dream. But it also allows me to give students what I had. This youth minister thing doesn't feel like a job. It feels like service to me because I am giving back to the place that gave so much to me. God believes in us. It's amazing what can happen when we believe in each other. It is amazing, isn't it? Um, that interview was so much fun to do because as mentioned, I walked along with Emma and Brandon on, on their journey as youth director and as, as a youth while I was counselor at, at Peace. Uh, I love these two dearly. And the number of conversations that I had with Brandon over the years uh, as he was growing uh, in his role as youth director and with Emma as, as a youth uh, and, and also in college were plenty. Now, Emma's conversations with Brandon were really focused on her future in, in youth ministry and what she wanted to do. My conversations for the most part, boyfriends, 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 oh yeah, and boyfriends. Yeah, and boyfriends, I know, yeah, I know. Just kidding, Emma, I love you, but we really did have a lot of those conversations. Um, but se seriously though, uh, one of, the, one of the, the, the biggest impactful conversations that I had with her was when she did tell me and she told Brandon that she was taking the job as youth director at Peace. Because she said one phrase that just is really stuck out to me and it made, it, it made an impact with me. She said, I'm coming home. It's so true. She's coming full circle. She's giving back to this church to what meant so much to her, which is exact, which is what I did when I decided to become a youth counselor years ago is give back to this current generation of youth for what meant so much to me years ago when I was in Atlanta. Now, Brandon and Emma, they love each other dearly and their impact is gonna be far reaching, not only in this church, but in the community at whole because they believe in each other. That's what we all need to do, right? We need to do more of encouraging and believing in each other, especially in this lousy year of 2020. I, I'm, I'm in that same boat, right? So if we just believe in each other and encourage each other, we'll get through all this together. I honestly believe that. Julie, back to you. Wow. That was really great and just such a really good testimony about the importance of believing in each other. And this week, uh, the kids went back to school. You probably all know that. They started online, and I was a little skeptical skeptical about maybe would I not have kids, but sure enough, they showed up, and they had a bit to say, and we talked a little bit about believing in each other. So let's check out the children's story and see what they have to say. Who's going to be showman? Showman it. All right, we're going to get started. Tell me what you guys know about the word belief. It could be religions or what you think is true. Motivational kind of stuff. You say like, you've got this. Just encourage people. Do you believe in me? Yeah, because that's a little hard to explain. I do believe in you because you're right there. If the question is changed to, do you believe that I, I'm going to do a good job on this vi editing this video, then I do. In worship this week, we are going to be talking about belief in one another. 
and it reminded me of this guy. Do you guys know who this guy is? Horton. Oh, it's you! Yeah! It's Horton! Oh, yeah, it's Horton! It's about an elephant, and he lavishes love onto a speck of dust. And the other animals, at first, they ridicule him. Then, they try to destroy the speck of dust and finally they put him in a cage. The sad part about this story is that Horton knew. He believed in the fact that this little speck of dust was worth something, but yeah. nobody believed in Horton. Don't you think it would be better if he had somebody alongside him saying, we believe in you? Do you think that that would have been easier or harder for him? If easier. He Way easier. Because you have motivation. Who believes in me? Yeah. My teacher is about going to my mom, my mom, my dad, my grandmother. We show our faith in each other, and that encourages us to be the Christians that we are. It encourages us to do better and learn in his name. We need to walk alongside each other and encourage each other. We've got to pray. Dear God, I'm thankful that I have um, a big house, a family. God loves me. I'm thankful that um, God made us and we're in this house being safe from like storms and stuff. I am thankful that I have a wide selection of books to keep me educated through these quarantines that I have a um, I have a super cool sister to play with. Thank you for making us so we can be here doing this meeting for church. I hope for world peace and I'm just very thankful. Thank you. Amen. That's a good lesson today, you guys. <laughs> Bye. 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 Next Wednesday. If you do, bye. 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 Okay, bye. bye. You know, um, they say that you know who your friends are when your car has to go to the shop to be fixed and you need a ride home. Have you ever needed that kind of uh, help at any point? I remember uh, my last car started shaking and progressively getting worse to the point that it sounded like it had a demon in the engine. And I had been changing the oil, the air filter, doing everything I could to avoid some big, expensive repair. Well, finally, one Monday morning, I'm in the drop-off line at Madison's school, and that's the point when my car decides that enough is enough and dies. So off to the shop it went. And thankfully, though, a dear friend not only met me at the shop, but also let me borrow their busted-up van so that I could get home. You know, we're uh, just beginning this new series called Ecclesia. Now, some say Ecclesia, others pronounce it Ecclesia. But nonetheless, the word is Greek for a gathering of people. An assembled community of faith. But it emphasizes this idea that the people are called together for a purpose, for a reason. Now, obviously, any kind of friendship is about more than just getting a ride to the auto shop, right? I mean, friendship's all about shared experiences and struggles and laughter and support. And these are all aspects of what it means to be in community with one another. But it's that called purpose. That's what makes the Ecclesia so important. See, the purpose for this community is to live out and reflect the love of Christ in our lives together. That's, that's Luke's description of what the early church was built on. But... What does that mean for us today? I mean, where do we even begin? For any friendship, it starts with belief in one another and trusting each other. And so today, let's see the beauty of having belief in one another and how that transforms a, a sense of purpose and direction within all of our lives. For that, friends, is Ecclesia.
desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy, what heart could
So this morning, we're going to be looking at two different sections of Acts chapter 9, and it's all taking place after Saul's conversion. And you know the story, right? It's, uh, it's you know, Saul's been uh, basically killing Christians and then has this encounter with the very real presence of Christ. And so in that moment, Saul becomes a faithful follower of Christ. And so these two stories have to do with uh, Saul's preaching and teaching about the power of Christ. But in the midst of this, we're going we're gonna to intentionally leave out one particular verse, and then, and then we'll come back to it in a little bit, and I promise when we do, we'll explain why we left it out in the first place. And so we're going to welcome our scripture reading for us this morning. It's uh, from a wonderful person who just overflows with these amazing stories. And so let's put our hands together, and let's welcome Miss D. Templeton. We're reading today in Acts 9, 19 through 25. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus is in the synagogues, saying he is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this man who made havoc in Jerusalem among those who invoked this name? And has he not come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priest? Saul became increasingly more powerful and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. After some time had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night so that they might kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. So, Jim, what's really happening here? I think they are still very much afraid of Saul. Right, right. I mean, let's just go with what Luke gives us, right? I mean, Saul is with the disciples currently, and we don't really know who those are. Right, and he's preaching here, right? Yeah, yeah, but then in verse 21, we see that people are starting to get skeptical of him. Yeah, but in verse 22, they start to pay attention. Yeah, and, but then they become confused, they feel threatened, and then all of a sudden, in verse 23, they plot to kill Saul. And the same disciples help Saul escape in verse 24. Right, right. So there's this pattern here, right? right. Uh, Saul's with the disciples. He's preaching boldly. They get th they, the people that he's preaching to feel threatened, and so they plot to kill him, mm -hmm. and then the disciples help him escape. So now, let's look at Acts chapter 9, verses 26, 28 to 30, and, uh, and let's hear what else happens. And so, D. And this reading today is Acts 9, 26, 28 30. When he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. So he went in and out among them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He spoke and argued with the Hellenist, but they were attempting to kill him. When the believers learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So does anything sound familiar there? <laughs> well, in verse 26, Saul is, tr Saul is trying to join the disciples. Right, but they're obviously afraid of him, right? So there's right. all this skepticism and there's this doubt. But in verse 28, Saul is preaching in Jerusalem. Right, we see him increasing in his effectiveness. Right, and then in verse 29, he, they, uh, they feel threatened by him and they're plotting to kill him. Right, and so then in verse 30, what do the disciples do? They help Saul escape. So do you see the pattern again? Saul's with the disciples, he's preaching boldly. They feel threatened. They plot to kill him. And then the disciples are the ones that help him escape. Okay, okay. I see the pattern. But what is the point of all of this? Well, it's interesting because it's like Luke is highlighting how challenging it was for Saul to be taken seriously. To be, to be trusted, to be uh, accepted by the apostles as this legitimate part of this emerging community of faith. 
But here's the really cool thing. So whenever you see in scripture a couple of stories that, that mirror each other and they're real close together, what we're supposed to do is stop for a moment and look at what lies in between those two stories. This was a way that an author would, would uh, bracket something to really highlight and make something stand out. And so we really need to look at verse 27 to see what Luke was trying to highlight. Do you want to hear yeah. verse 27? Yeah. I'm glad you uh, said <laughs> yes. Um, so here's verse 27. But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and described for them, this is Barnabas, right. how on the road Saul had seen the Lord, who had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. Okay, sorry, Jim. I'm still not getting it. I don't understand what the point of 27 is. I, I don't get it. Well, I, I understand why. I mean, it's really not a lot to go on here, right. right? I mean, it's just one sentence that basically says that Barnabas takes Saul to the apostles and vouches for him, right? But I think the real question we need to ask is why does Luke place that sentence right there? Why does Luke intentionally tell the story in this way? Uh, because... Barnabas believed in Saul. He was Saul's only encourager. Right, right. It's cool because Luke's highlighting the fact that Barnabas was a voice for Saul before Saul ever had a voice himself. And that's what comes from us believing in each other. That's what we draw out of each other. You know, God's word is so amazing, and a lot of times we don't even see those subtle messages, and that is such a cool message, the power of encouraging and believing in each other. And thank you so much for sharing the word with us this morning, Dee. Can we all now take this time and bow our heads in prayer? Holy and gracious God, this is the day you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. For you promise your beloved rest. You are ever so close to us, God. We can do all things through you, for you are the source of our strength. Let us all, let all we do honor you as you encourage us. Let us be an encouragement to those around us. Remind us when we falter or fail that you uphold us. Your merciful hand has purposed our lives, and we cannot outrun your love, God. You weave our stories throughout ancient history and on to tomorrow, and you number our days and surround us with our, your love. God, there is so much to be frustrated about in this life on earth. There is grave injustice, oppression, and unfairness everywhere we look, disastrous weather events and horrific acts of violence. We have fear of losing our lives or our loved ones to disease and disaster. But you, God, you are our comforter through it all. It is in your word, your holy word, that we are reminded that in your arms we can throw our anxieties and find safety and protection when the world seems to press into our lives harder than we can bear, we know we are never holding on alone. You remind us to be strong and courageous, to rely on you for strength and not to fear. Yes, God, please continue to be our example. Encourage us, encourage us so that we know how to be encouragers to others. Help us to navigate the tricky waters of relationships on this earth and hurdle the stumbling blocks the enemy lies in our paths daily. We know in this world we will have trouble, but we do not want to let it steal our joy. For you, you, God, have overcome this world. Let us take heart in this truth. We ask all of this in your holy and gracious name. Amen. And now Jonathan and the online choir have prepared for us a, a special this morning. And if you remember Jim at the beginning of the service mentioning the QR code, well, this is the point where it's going to show up on the screen. And all you have to do is take a picture of it with your your, your phone, and it'll take you directly to the giving page. So please now enjoy this offering called Put Peace Into Others' Hands.
admittedly, <laughs> I struggle with uh, this idea that Luke puts forward of their, this need for acceptance into an ecclesia, right? I read how, how Barnabas brings Saul to the 12 disciples, or the apostles and, and vouches for him. And, and I can't help but picture the apostles sitting up real high in these great big thrones. You know, with Barnabas and Saul carefully approaching them, afraid to, to look them in the eye. Kind of like Dorothy and everyone else when they're approaching the Wizard of Oz. It makes me think about my first days of middle school. <laughs> We're getting on the bus was kind of like that scene from Forrest Gump as I walked down the aisle looking for a seat and people sliding over and telling me, nope, you can't sit here. I, you can't sit next to me here. It hurt not to be accepted. It was painful not to be included. And so I wonder how many of us go through similar emotions. Gosh, even when we walk into church, Remember those days when we used to walk into the church? <laughs> Have you thought about that? Because for some of us, we're used to being able to walk up to the portico and grabbing our cup of coffee, walking into the sanctuary, right? Mingling with people and then going right to our seat. We don't wonder if uh, there'll be coffee in the portico. We don't think about whether uh, our seat will be taken or not. We don't consider whether we're welcome here or not. But what about those who come through the doors of this place for the very first time? What about those who, who make that journey up to the portico and see the crowd of people and have to navigate through them or who walk into the room, right, and scan the room wondering where they're going to sit, not knowing a soul? Can you imagine the emotions that they must be going through? So friends, like it or not, acceptance is a part of any community. And so clearly, Barnabas here has accepted Saul. But not only did Barnabas accept Saul, he listened to him. Think about that for a minute. Barnabas wasn't there when Saul went on uh, killing Christians over and over again, right? Barnabas didn't witness Saul standing there holding Stephen's clothes as he was stoned to death. Barnabas didn't watch as Saul had this encounter with Jesus. He didn't hear the words that Jesus said to Saul. So logic would state that Barnabas must have, have sat down with Saul at some point and listened to the story. He probably asked questions about how bad it actually was for Saul beforehand or what emotions that he might have been going through in the midst of this miraculous conversion moment. See, the text doesn't say this, but I kind of picture Barnabas and Saul sitting somewhere in a small little restaurant, right? Both with a cup of coffee, and Barnabas is there hanging on Saul's every word. Barnabas doesn't speak. Barnabas doesn't condemn. He doesn't judge Saul for his past. He listens. He asks questions. And as Barnabas sits there and listens to Saul, it boils down to trust. See, Barnabas believed in Saul. He saw the potential that overflowed from Saul's spirit and the way in which Saul would testify to Christ. Barnabas, Barnabas doesn't focus on his past. He considers who Saul is becoming. He focuses in on Saul's possibility. And so in order to take that step, in order to, to stand up for Saul and, and plead his case to the apostles, logic would state that Barnabas is trusting Saul. He trusts his story. He trusts the authenticity of what Saul has shared and, and who he was now. Barnabas had to trust in Saul enough to not only speak up for him, but Barnabas is the one who empowers Saul to share the gospel story with others. <laughs> I hope you're with me here. Acceptance 
listening with love and trust. These actions, they, they come from one who fully believes in another. This is what happens as a, as a community is born, as Ecclesia begins to take shape. Now, you could say, and, and rightfully so, that everything that I just shared with you is quite a leap from just one verse, verse 27. I mean, how do we get acceptance, listening with love and not judgment and, and trust, out of Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles? Well, when Luke says Barnabas took him and brought him, he uses the word epilabenomai. But this doesn't mean he took him and, and gave him a ride or held his hand and walked him there or, or picked him up from the auto shop because his car broke down. No, this is a verb that's active. It contains this sense of like force and importance. Luke means that Barnabas takes Saul under his wing. The word means to, to attach or to align oneself to another. So some sociologists say that having a religious conversion, it's really no big deal at all. <laughs> they go on to say that the miraculous part comes when someone's able to maintain that belief and that conviction for the long haul. In other words, Saul might have become Paul in this incredible moment of epiphany with Christ, right? But the only way he could remain Paul was through the ongoing presence of somebody in his life who would help him discover his God-given gifts through Barnabas' discipleship. So it really isn't a, a theological stretch to say that Barnabas poured into Saul's life, that his belief in Saul created this pathway for Saul's new life and ministry. See, in taking Saul under his wing... We can see how Saul took on the very nature of Barnabas, embracing his teaching, allowing Barnabas' understanding of Christ to influence his own. And so those words, acceptance, listening with love, trust, friends, they don't, they don't just come out of thin air. We see these words in Paul's letters, in his writings. Think about it, with this idea of Barnabas' mentoring, as if Barnabas influencing Saul, his writing takes on a much deeper meaning. In terms of acceptance, Paul writes in Romans chapter 15, accept one another just as Christ has accepted you. Don't you think he learned that lesson from what he saw in Barnabas? In terms of listening with love and not judgment, we read those infamous words from 1 Corinthians 13. Anybody been to a wedding recently? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Love does not delight evil, but rejoices with the truth. You tell me that he didn't experience that from Barnabas. In terms of trust, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians says, And such is the trust that we have through Christ. Our sufficiency is from God. Barnabas modeled that to Saul. And so as Barnabas took Saul to see the apostles sitting high up in their thrones, ready to embrace him or not, I wonder what he said to him along the way. I wonder if Barnabas planted the following idea within Saul with each and every one of their steps down that long corridor to the Wizard of Oz. With Barnabas' arm around Saul, approaching this group that he longs to be accepted by. Can't you just hear Barnabas whispering in Saul's ear, Saul, remember in this moment, remember that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy peace and patience, kindness, goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Saul, we live by the Spirit, so in this moment, keep in step with the Spirit. So yeah, verse 27, 
It's just one verse in the middle of these two major stories that focus on Saul right on the heels of his conversion. But verse 27 speaks volumes about the importance of community, about what can happen when there is acceptance, listening with love and trust. Friends, when there is someone who believes in another, when there's someone who's willing to support, to encourage, and to reflect Christ's love, that is what Ecclesia looks like. So we might not know much about Barnabas, but because of the life of Saul, we can see the deep impact of what it means to have someone believe in you. Have you ever heard of Dadobi Naroji? He helped start the Indian independence movement in 1857, bringing results through peace and nonviolence. He befriended someone, and through his teaching, Mahatma Gandhi became the living monument to peace and activism through nonviolent methods. Have you ever heard of Mary Duncan? She was a fourth grade teacher filled with compassion and empathy for her students. She would sit and listen to their concerns and their hurts and their fears. Mrs. Duncan had one particular student who, after listening to her pour out her heart, Mrs. Duncan didn't judge her, but she encouraged her to believe in herself, even having her stand in front of the class and read to them on a regular basis. And this student, Oprah Winfrey, <laughs> went on to become a symbol for strength and independence across the world. Lastly, Dr. Benjamin Mays. He was a pastor, a scholar. He was president of Morehouse College. But have you heard of him? See, his teaching focused on the importance of upholding the dignity of all human beings despite unfair social practices. He had a great impact on one particular student, bonding with him, and they became friends. For life. And this man, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., would later refer to Dr. May as his spiritual and emotional father. Friends, most likely we can all sit here and we can think about who those people have been in our lives. Who's had an impact on us because of their belief in us, their acceptance of us, their, their listening ear and their lack of, of judgment, their, their trust in us. Can you think of who that person has been in your life? In fact, why don't we take a moment here and, and put some of those names in the comments section. Throw some of those lessons there. Come on, let's see this whole list fill up in that comment section of all of these people who have had significant impact on our lives. Think about it. Where would you be in your life right now without them? Chances are your life is different because of them, right? Right? Friends, this is what community is all about. This is the love of Christ that Barnabas was illustrating to Saul and to all of us. And so the question for us today is how can we be that for someone else? How can we believe in each other? How can we accept those who will come into this community in the future? Can we listen with loving ears, not with judgment? Can we, can we trust those who will sit one day in these same chairs with the rest of us in the future? Well, friends, I believe that we can. I believe that we will be a voice for those who don't have a voice at this point that we will be a community that helps others learn to live like Christ, helping them discover what's possible within themselves. And so maybe we all just need to be a Barnabas, <laughs> a quiet, unassuming, single, solitary sentence in the life of someone else, but make an eternal impact that will go on to change the world. Oh my gosh. We're so excited because we get to see this in action this morning. I mean, from the interview uh, with Emma and, and Brandon to, to hearing those amazing kids from our community up until now, this point in our worship. You see, this closing song by our praise team is extra special this morning. It's amazing. 
through the joys of technology, Stephanie and, and Ken, they've been able to shepherd the praise team through this recording process that it will actually merge together live musicians here that you're going to see with pre-recorded voices. We're going to have the virtual praise team with us in worship this morning. We heard it in the hallway earlier. It's awesome. But as you enjoy this musical offering, the prayer that we have is that you don't just let the words wash over you. Friends, hear me here. As you enjoy this this morning, Think about the effort that it took to make this moment happen. Think about the leadership that has drawn the gifts out of this praise team. That they are continuing to discover, to grow, and to utilize their gifts to inspire all of us to be a Barnabas for someone else. Friends, in this moment, we are going to see Ecclesia in action. And so let's worship, let's celebrate, and let's enjoy being Barnabases for others. Amen. One, two, one, two, one, two.
That was amazing. That was really that was good. so good, you guys. It's been fun <laughs> doing all these different kinds of creative things, and that was definitely a fun thing there. You know, this was a great message, Jim, and a lot of people commented on the Facebook. Brittany, um, you know, she said her nana Maxine was a mentor, somebody that believed in her. Virginia, Father John and Grandma Mary, G Joanna, a mentor, Deanna Rolf, Kay Robinson, her mom, and the list just goes on and on. There were a lot of responses, and I know for me, people have peppered my life throughout, you know, encouraging me, but when I was going through my master's, um, Roberta Jones was definitely a mentor there. I would go to her house and sit with her and um, her, her family, and we would chit-chat about the challenges that she faced, and it was such an encouragement and help for me to hear her journey because it helped me then persevere through some of the difficult spots that I had, but really great message. Yeah, today. it's really Thank cool. You. I mean, we can think of those people, and really, I hope that we're all kind of sitting here also thinking about then, who can we be that person to mm -hmm. for someone else? And we should just be asking all of us that question of, who am I currently pouring into? Who am I encouraging? Who am I believing in to the point that their gifts are beginning to bubble up to the surface, and they're beginning to trust that, that they can use those gifts to bring God glory? And so, um, my hope is that we're all going to consider who that person might be for us and begin to intentionally engage in that work. You know, and I think another. that's the key, being intentional. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And so uh, let's, um, let's go ahead and join in prayer as we close out this morning. Uh, pray with me, please. Loving and gracious God, in these moments, help us to think about who it is that you have placed in our midst that we can be a Barnabas to. Help us to find ways to pour into someone, to encourage them, and to believe in them that they may become the fullness of who God has created them to be. And so help us, Lord, to live this out this week. Help us to carry this message into the world, into the community. Maybe it's even in the midst of our home. But help us to live this out. For it's in your holy and blessed name that we pray. Amen. Can we put our hands together one more time for the amazing praise team? Oh my gosh, Ooh. that was awesome. Great. Thank you so much. It worked, right? It, did, it worked. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> and so we hope that uh, next Sunday you join us in worship, but also that you come for our uh, big red bus um, opportunity to donate blood and, uh, and, and contribute in a significant way. We also hope that you pick up some coffee in one of those Peace Church mugs. Maybe somebody can pick one up for Jeremy on the way and, uh, and support Advancing Native Missions. It's awesome. Always, we want you to go now to our YouTube page if you want to continue and participate in communion or continue to worship. We've got some options for you there. But it is great to see all of you. We're thrilled that you're, uh, that you're a part of this Ecclesia, and we can't wait to see you next week. And so have a great week, everyone. We'll see you then. Bye.